Hi, thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to be discussing uh, the latest research uh, from Olfed, in which we put together a lot of the research that we've already done in the past. And we try to lay down how an effective response to an, a global catastrophic food shock could look like. So if you'd like to uh, discuss this topic with me, you can get me at olfed.info slash fun, or you can ask, uh, contact me on Discord or find me around the hallways on the conference. So let's jump into it. We've already had a few people today talking about these things, so I'm not going to uh, say much. Uh, so, but basically, there are different mechanisms where that could originate what we call an abrupt sunlight reduction scenario, uh, in which a large amount of aerosol material gets into the atmosphere and causes a significant reduction of the amount of sunlight that reaches the surface of the Earth. And in the most extreme cases, that could cause uh, a full-blown agricultural collapse and so what happens is that temperature is reduced significantly, as well as precipitation and humidity, so all things that plants need to grow. And so other research teams have estimated that in the absence of a significant response to this, uh, we could get up to maybe 80% mortality of the human population or even more. So let's think a little bit about what we can do to prevent that, should something like this were to happen. So in order to see how we can respond to this, we need to look at how the situation looks now and how it could look after, according to the climate models and growth models. So on the left, you can see some charts representing current uh, global food production and consumption. Uh, you can see that we are producing uh, about 5,600 kilocalories per person per day uh, currently. Uh, just under half of that is uh, food for animals. Uh, the, uh, about a significant chunk of that is uh, as well biofuels. And then there's the food that we consume uh, at the households. Um, and then with uh, if, uh, there's also the, the uh, stockpiles uh, that we have. Some countries have uh, a few months of stockpiles, uh, others not much. Uh, and in short, what would happen in like one of the most extreme, say, nuclear volcanic winter scenarios? Well, with no response to that, we could lose like about 80 to 90 percent of global food output from falling agricultural yields. And that would really result in about 1,200 kilocalories per capita, according to our model for a 150 teragram of food scenario uh, in terms of uh, in a volcanic winter scenario. And that would mean that we are not anywhere near the minimum human requirement of 2,100 kilocalories per capita per day. And <clears throat> let's look at what the things that we can do to counter that. So we've looked at resilient food solutions uh, as an intervention to counter the, the loss of yields and be able to reach that, that minimum threshold of nutrition. And so some of the things that we have included in the model are things that we have been researching for quite some time, such as rapid deployment at a massive scale of seaweed cultivation in coastal zones. Uh, another very important intervention is the relocation of cool tolerant crops from the places and regions where they are being cultivated now to the new climactic zones that would arise after the abrupt reduction, sunlight reduction scenario, uh, in order to be able to better utilize you know, what little sunlight we would have uh, in that kind of type of scenario. And in a similar vein, we have um, the idea of deploying uh, simple greenhouses to be able to more efficiently utilize the sunlight. A different type of solution, uh, what we call industrial foods, uh, is uh, about utilizing, uh, leveraging industrial infrastructure, whether by repurposing the existing one or by uh, construction of new factories to be able to produce uh, sunlight independent food from sunlight, um, so from feedstocks receiving to sunlight reduction. And so putting this all together and allocating things uh, the best way we can, we looked at how that would look in terms of macronutrition, you know, fat, calories, protein. And we find that we should be able, uh, if we are able to effectively deploy all of these solutions, to produce about 2,600 kilocalories per capita, which is above the minimum um, <clears throat> recommended requirement. So technically should be able to produce enough food to feed everyone, even in this very extreme scenario. But that is still about half of the amount of food that we are producing now. 
In order to incorporate critical uncertainties uh, in the model, we did um, a Monte Carlo analysis with a thousand scenarios with, uh, that yields about a 95% um, confidence that we should be able to um, reach uh, levels above the minimum human requirements by deploying these solutions. And we also uh, compared how adding or removing certain uh, of these, uh, you know, resilient interventions would look in terms of uh, calories and nutrition and the crop relocation of, um, you know, cultural landscapes to the new uh, climatic zones seems to be the most promising uh, solution so far. Uh, so without it, we would be able to, uh, we will have a much harder time feeding people, but it requires a lot of uh, cooperation and trade between regions. And so the fact that we technically can produce enough food to feed everyone, even in such a dire scenario, does not mean that everyone would necessarily be fed, right? So the prices of some uh, goods, some foods would skyrocket, maybe up to tenfold its current value or more. And the communities that would suffer the most would naturally be the communities that are suffering the most uh, today from malnutrition, which is the most economically uh, underdeveloped uh, nations. And so what that means is that due to rising food costs, uh, a lot of people would not be able to afford it, even if we had more than enough to feed everyone. And so the regions that would be particularly hit, uh, is, is something like this were to happen, even with an effective response uh, coordinated uh, around the world, would be Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia in particular, and many others. And so it looks like we would be needing uh, subsidization and rationing in order to be able to deal with this, you know, if we have enough food to feed everyone. And so this highlights how incredibly important it is that we look into not only technological solutions, but also economic and political solutions to these scenarios. So finally, where are we going to take this research next? So we have done a very high level analysis of global production and consumption, and we want to move into a more fine-grained regional analysis, perhaps even country by country, in terms of looking at the potential of each region to produce resilient foods. And we also want to look more in depth into the economics, competition, hoarding, and do a little bit of political analysis to look at how cooperation would look like between countries, which also depends on the nature of the abrupt sunlight reduction scenario that we're dealing with, and the different type trade scenarios that will arise after such a catastrophe. And finally, we are working to move from the results of this research to creating real resilience and preparedness in the world today. And some ways that we are doing that is by promoting the creation and development of pilot tests for deployment, the rapid deployment of these resilient food solutions, as well as looking into which policies we can uh, implement and whether we can put preparedness plans in place, such as there are for other catastrophes, such as tsunamis and so on. So uh, please feel free to connect uh, with me regarding this if you'd like to collaborate and contribute at offer.info. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, that's, that was really fascinating. Yeah, I think we've got a question from Mike. Hi, um, Mike Cassidy, Oxford. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that talk. Um, I was going to ask about if you've looked at the potential for um, phosphorus and phosphate, uh, you know, nitrogen, you know, fertilizer supplies being cut off from, you know, one of these disasters and how that would affect food in a nuclear winter scenario as well. Right. So, in a way, that's kind of... That's a follow-up analysis that we're doing. And we are in fact working on like a separate research paper where we are looking at the crop relocation of the growing part of the solution in a much more depth. And there we will be looking at that part of the equation. Um, right now, the model, the model that we've um, developed here does incorporate that to some degree, but we'll be looking into that in a much more depth. And certainly the application of uh, fertilizers and their availability is a very important part of uh, the high yields that we are getting uh, from the relocated crops, even in this scenario. If that were not to be there, then a lot of that yield would be lost and we'd have to rely on the other solutions in the resilient food portfolio more. Any other questions? If, if not, I guess I'll just say, 
it, it struck me as like somewhat obscene the um, the use of this of these very scarce calories on uh, animal products, which I presume would just be hoarded in in the rich world. Um, yeah, um, like w w what do you think the scenarios that are likely there are? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Sorry, just kind of um, yeah. Um, in when you when you are modeling this, uh, what kind of uh, animal products are being produced and who's consuming them? Oh right, of course. Well, uh, livestock and poultry, I think, are the two main uses of these, as well as uh, dairy cattle. And it's mostly developed countries that are consuming these products. You know, it's a net calorie sink, after all. So you put a lot of human animal calories in to this animal agriculture, animal industrial farming system, and you get a few calories out that are a little higher in terms of nutritional qualities. And so, well, developing nations are also starting to increase their meat and animal product consumption. So these uh, net calorie sinks only seems to be getting bigger and bigger. 